Yes, we do. Believe we do. All right, wonderful. Um, let's we'll stand for the pledge. I right, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, United States of America, America to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, one nation one, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. So let's move on to attendance. <clears throat> Ready, A. Impostato. Present. A. Lu a. Lewitt. Present. D. Mello. Present. B. Reyes. Here. M. Russo. Present. J. Sanford. Here. E. Seitzman. Present. I'll read the announcement regarding notice, of the Open Public Meetings Act. I would like to advise those present that notice of this regular meeting of the Housing Authority of the City of Hoboken has been provided to the public in accordance with provisions of the Open Public Meeting Act. Notice of this regular meeting of Thursday, January 27th, 2022, was given by publication of the annual meeting notice of the authority with amendments as necessary and was sent to the Jersey Journal and Star Ledger as a public notice on Tuesday, January 18th, 2022, as notification to the general public of the meeting. Sent to the City Clerk of Hoboken on Tuesday, January 18th, 2022, with a copy of the agenda to be posted on the bulletin board in City Hall, the Hoboken Public Library, and Hoboken Police Department, and posted on the Authority website on Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. I direct the minutes of this meeting to state that I have announced that adequate notice of this meeting has been given as required by the Open Public Meetings Act. In addition, I direct the minutes of this meeting to state the following. As a result of an emergency declared by governor, the governor of New Jersey, the meeting will be conducted exclusively through the use of communications equipment. This procedure is in accordance with NJSA 10-4-9.3, which states that a public body shall not be deemed to have violated any provision of the Open Public Meeting Act in conducting a meeting by means of communication or other electronic equipment. In addition, this procedure complies with Article 3, Section 7 of the Authority Bylaws, which allows for participation in authority meetings by members of the Board of Commissioners by means of telephone conference or similar telephonic or communications equipment. And then, Councilor, do you want to sum that up? I know we, we're just going directly into closed session. Yes, we are going into closed session. That is the only purpose for this meeting. We will be adopting a resolution to that effect. Accordingly, anyone who is on the public portion that is occurring now um, should understand that after we adopt this resolution, um, only those people who are permitted to be in closed session will remain. We will indeed come out of closed session, but at that point, the only thing we will do is adjourn. We will not take any action in closed session and will not take any action when we come out of closed session. So the practical impact of that is that the public will be excluded from the rest of the meeting once this resolution is adopted as a special meeting. There will not be any opportunity for the public to comment on any subject. This meeting is limited to the sub specific special subject of what is being called repositioning of the authority under the RAD program and other planning issues related to it. If anybody in the public does indeed want to comment on that issue or any other housing authority issue, they have the opportunity to do that at the next regular meeting of the authority which occurs on February 10th, starting at 7, and those have procedures, the regular meetings, for the public to make comment at that time, and it can include anything related to the various repositioning meetings that have occurred so far that have occurred in public session. Okay. Back to you, Chair. All right, and then... All right, so I guess I'm gonna call the, uh, I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 
Actually, I guess I should read the title first. So resolution number 2022-01.07, a resolution of the Housing Authority of the City of Hoboken to enter into closed session to discuss issues presented in the repositioning of the authority's public housing. I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All right, we have a second. Could we uh, have a vote, please? Hey, and Pistato. Yes. Hey, Lewitt. Yes. D. Mello. Yes. B. E. Reyes. Yes. M. Russo. Aye. J. Sanford. Yes. E. Seitzman. Yes. Okay, so it passes. We need to now have everybody clear out and we need to stop the Facebook feed. Okay, Angel, please stop the feed of Facebook and remove. I don't see anyone really on this meeting but us right now. We have no member of the public. Um, the Facebook is stopped. Should I stop recording or keep recording? Keep recording, Angel. Yes, we, we've recorded the closed sessions for future reference, I believe, in all cases, and I don't see any reason to change that. Yep, I agree with that. All right, so um, I guess uh, Torty Gallus and partners, they have the floor. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, Mr. Miller, uh, Mr. Rick, I thought you were going to take the lead. Yeah, and okay. I jumped in and I was muted. Can you believe that? Um, so, so no, I'm, I'm my, my now, apologies, director. If you could, no, that's okay. I'm now I'm now unmuted. Um, uh, this is a follow up in many ways to to our closed session of last week. Um, during the week, I sent out kind of a summary memo of our discussion points um, from last week, and uh, uh, Lourdes and uh, Angel, can I do a share screen here? No problem. Um, yep, I believe I can. And what I'm going to do is put up the memo I put, put uh, that I put out this past week. It was kind of a summary of the discussion points of last week. And what I'd like to accomplish with this meeting is to go over those discussion points. Um, uh, those are points that the planning team really needs. I'd like to be able to review them, prompt any more discussion we need on those points. And then uh, Torty Gallus has a, a presentation for us as well once I'm done that really follows up um, on the memo. And, and, and my point on the points I make in the, in the memo and the points that you had as discussion points. Um, these are uh, discussion points and, and directions that, that we all need as staff and our planning team uh, to move forward to finish off the plan. Um, so we need, to, we need to focus in on these and make sure that, that we're all um, in the same direction. So I am going to share this screen and use this Mark, if I may, uh, between last week's meeting and, and today, didn't you also have a discussion about these with your committee? Yes, we did. Um, we did go to the uh, Renovation Redevelopment Committee and reviewed this, uh, as I said in my uh, email when I sent this out. And so it's already been reviewed and through committee as well. And uh, had a good discussion at that meeting this past week. Thank you, Jaime. Yep. Um, so in the memo, I talk about again how this is confidential. This is part of the closed session process. Um, and, and I talk about and how, how it was presented by the Torty Gallus team on January 13th of really four major issues that, that we put on the table and discussed at that meeting. And the first was talking about the preferred bedroom mix and should that bedroom mix be maintained or should there be an adjustment for current under or over housing conditions. The second issue was the total development unit count range and what that should be. Um, the third was an acceptable range of building heights. And the fourth is the preferred phasing strategy. Uh, should all existing units be replaced first? Should mixed income units be incorporated into the mid phases? So that was kind of the four questions that were on the table um, last uh, meeting we had on January 13th. And uh, those questions were developed in accordance with our principles that we passed back in June. Um, so what I did along with input from our planning team and reviewed by the attorney and then subsequently through our uh, committee um, is put down my understanding of, of what I thought the board's preliminary thoughts were. 
And and, I th and we thought that this would be functional in order to remind us of where we were last week in order to move the conversation forward and, uh, and see if, if we've got uh, agreement as we move forward. Um, so this is my understanding of the board's preliminary thoughts. And I think it might be best is as we go through this, um, we have discussion on, on, on the seven points that are included here. Um, so if, if anyone's got discussion on them, it'll probably be good. I'll, I'll read one and then we'll take some time to discuss it and go through it and go from there. Um, so number one, uh, one for one replacement remains the overall guiding principle as does assurance that there will be no displacement of existing residents. Um, so that, that was first. And, and I think from the beginning of this process, that's been number one um, uh, as, we, as we move forward. I should have said introduction uh, as we go through these. Um, we would like, and I would like that at the meeting on February 10th, um, that, that we go public, it's time. And, and we, we, we find our, our, our discussion points and our issues with the board internally, and then we move forward. And I think February 10th would be a good time to, to go public and, and go from there on this. So anyway, back to number one. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a slam dunk, it seems to me. One for one replacement, the overall guiding principle, the assurance that there will be no displacement of existing residents, right? Solid, no questions. All right, good. Question, this is Terry, the court reporter. I just hey, see that, it, hi, mm -hmm. not to interrupt, but there it says recording pause. And I didn't know if you had said that you wanted to record my, mine is saying recording pause. So I don't know if we're re supposed to be recording, but I'm just letting anyone know that that's what I see on my screen. My, mine is still strobing with the red light and saying okay. it's- Okay. Okay. Yeah, mine says recording also. Okay. And, and now it just popped up with a sentence saying this webinar is being recorded. So same here. So, okay, thank you for that, Terry. Um, I always want to keep on top of the tech. Okay. Um, the uh, number two, the apartment size mix can be adjusted to account for current under or over housing conditions. Uh, again, if, for example, if we've got a um, a single person living in a three bedroom, that as we go into the redevelopment, that person person's unit or the unit count for that would be adjusted to know we need a, a one bedroom rather than a three. Vice versa, if somebody is overhoused and needs a larger uh, unit size, that our gross unit count would take that into account and uh, we would add a larger unit to our overall unit count because of the reality on the ground of our family sizes. Any comments on that one? Number three, the low end of the acceptable unit count range is full replacement of the 1,354 existing units, including the 200 Fox, units, Fox Hill units, which will remain. No maximum number of units was established. The board would like to maintain the flexibility in future phases to account for changing conditions and the potential to add other affordable housing units throughout the city. That's a mouthful, right? A few, few concepts in there? At least Question. a couple? Yeah. My question is, why are we talking full replacement of 1,354 existing units when the main campus has, I think, 804 units? Uh, we're, we're not talking about knocking down the senior buildings. No, we're not. Good. No, we're not. Absolutely not. That's not in the plan at this point. We Just to be clear, everything we see right now shows substantial renovation. Okay. On the other lease, and and I don't know whether we need to make that a little clear. In I would suggest there. I would suggest say full replacement or preservation of. I, I think I, that I works. Agree. The, the only the only word choice I would use differently is rehabilitation, just because that's the word used in land use law in New Jersey. Yeah. Or so, or, or rehabilitation. For 5,000 units, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we have the, uh, the flexibility. Dad, Aaron, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> listen, do listen, Dr. Mike, that's where we got the flexibility, all right? <laughs> so let's just make sure we're on the same page here. Number three should now be the full replacement or what's your preference word? 
or rehabilitation, or, right? Or rehabilitation. Of the 1354. Yes, okay. Correct. Everybody all right on that? Yep. If you're going to, I'm sorry, if you're going to do that, I, I don't even know if you need the parentheses at that point, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Because it's almost like, why are, why are we distinguishing Fox Hill? Yeah. yeah. Well, the reason for the parentheses, Commissioner, okay. is because we want it clear that with respect to Fox Hill, those units are already underway in terms of whatever rehabilitation is going to be made. Well, maybe Not maybe maybe, maybe, maybe state that maybe yeah, the, Fox Hill we, underway, or get rid of the which will remain clause because it's like including the four hundred Fox Hill units currently getting there, currently undergoing rehabilitation. Yeah, I, I like what uh, Commissioner Russo suggested would be, which would be to say including the two hundred Fox Hill units, which are already undergoing rehabilitation. Right, already undergoing. Yeah, that's great. That's perfect. Well, D Dave said 400 units, so we should add that. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, you did. Check the tape. <laughs> we got him, Aaron. Good. <laughs> nope. So where do you want to put the 800? Yeah, right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you got nice. Anything more on this one? I like those changes. And I, I mean, I, 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 to me, it's, it'd be just as well to say including the Fox Hill units. Um, but um, that, that's fine. We're going to expand on that. Well, the concern I have there is that I don't want somebody in Fox Hill and then turn around and say, and you're going to do more work on my, our units too? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think the currently undergoing is yeah. sufficient. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I think that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I also want to just, just plant the seed that as we go through this, um, you know, five years from now, there's certainly a possibility of doing another Fox Hill deal and, and doing more work at Fox Hill. Um, so just, just to keep that in mind, that, that I, and I think that's going to be inevitable in the Hoboken Housing Authority's future, is more work at Fox Hill. Um, if you remember, we did Fox Hill at a very small amount of work so we could get a rat under our belt and, and see all the benefits from that. But in the long term, I, I think it'll be interesting. It will be essential to, to redo Fox Hill. But that's another story. We, we, uh, but we I said that on the record when we took the finance yeah. and everything else that that would be the first stage. We did, and and I think I think to put in here uh, that idea of Fox Hill, which is currently under innovation, is perfectly under perfectly appropriate. Do you, Do you want to add uh, that uh, Fox Hill, which which has converted to Section Eight already and is undergoing rehabilitation? I think that's unnecessary detail. I think just to emphasize that including the 200 foxhole units um, already undergoing rehabilitation. Very good, anything else? All right, uh, number four, uh, the first phase building, F1, should be six stories. And we'll, we'll, we'll see in the graphic that Tori Gallus is to remind everyone what where F1 is and what we're looking at should be six stories. Increased height in later phases, particularly along the west side of the main campus, could be appropriate. There was a request to include a variety of building heights in the concept plan to help with visualization and to convey that it will not necessarily all be homogeneous. Another big paragraph. So the first, uh, the first item there, just to get everyone on the same page, six stories on the first building, right? Increased height in later phases along the west side of the main campus could be appropriate. And that uh, variety of building heights uh, request uh, to help with visualization can convey that it won't be homogeneous, so. This is a, this is a very, very piddly thing, admittedly. Can we say it could be deemed appropriate? <clears throat> Mark? No, oh, yeah, I, I was just rereading the sentence. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't see personally why deemed would change the meaning of that sentence. Oh, I usually hear that sentiment conveyed. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have no problem putting that word in. Um, right. Just getting my head around it. Okay. Okay, good. 
And anything else on number four? Yes. Uh, you had a comment, yes. right? Yeah, my, my, my only comment, and I'm not going to defend it real strongly, is if we do six stories instead of eight or nine stories, the project itself, the completion of the project, will take an extra couple of years, two or three years at least because we have fewer relocation units. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, 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 just to get it on the record as well, I, I agree, Aaron, and, and um, I'm <laughs> hopeful uh, that we can find potential property elsewhere to make up that time somewhere along this process. Um, so let's keep our fingers crossed and hopefully we can do that. Good. Thanks. Here, 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 here on that, you know, I, I, I'm very much into doing more more peppering instead of telling our residents that this is the only part of town we deem them worthy to live in. I think that's an awful message. So anything you could do, councilman, to get us some uh, ability to build elsewhere is-, is Yes, sir. Working on it. <laughs> good job, good job. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know of anyone here that's contrary to that whatsoever. I think that's sort of like the one for one replacement concept, right? Um, who can argue with that? Let's, boy, let's do it. I'd, I'd like nothing better. Thank you. Uh, number five, the preferred strategy is to replace existing units and house only existing residents for at least the first few phases. The F1 building is an agreed upon starting point. Mixed income should only be included when it takes care of the residents from the targeted existing buildings. And the mixed income units are limited to units that are above those necessary to serve the households in the targeted buildings. Another big paragraph, right? Mm -hmm. So our strategy is replace existing units and house existing residents for the first few phases. By then we'll be a number of years down the line and we'll be doing, we may well be doing some different things, but our first core, one of our first core principles is house our existing residents. <laughs> As a result of that, it may be, number six, it may be beneficial to incorporate the Christopher Columbus building as part of the second or third phase to prevent front loaded concentration of public housing units in the north end of the main campus in the event that mixed income units are introduced in later phases. And I think I, I think when we get to the Torty Gallus graphic that's gonna come up here in a moment, um, I, I think that will be kind of clear on, on what this, this concept means here. Um, and I think this idea that um, Christopher Columbus is a, is a, is a great site uh, to start building a building and start using that as part of the relocation, I think is a real positive here. Um, so this was stated, it may be beneficial just to repeat to incorporate Christopher Columbus building as part of the second or third phase to prevent front loaded concentration of public housing units in the north end of the main campus. Uh, last seven later phases need flexibility in terms of unit counts potential mixing of incomes and uses, and building height. Obtaining additional sites for replacement housing elsewhere in the city could help in dealing with the concentration of poverty. I thought that was a little repetitive from the other one, but I, I thought it was important to stick in there. Yeah, I, I, I think once we go out to get the money, uh, all the loans and, and bonds, I think they wanna know what the entire project will cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and how we're going to raise all that money. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can go building by building. Uh, I mean, do you have an opinion on that, uh, this idea? And what you're talking about, Aaron, is, is, is the whole project, complete, 1,354 years, everything, what that projection is as opposed to just going into building F1 and then into the first phase of relocation we're doing from F1. Correct me, Jamie. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Why did you put me on the spot here? Yeah, why not? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's not unusual for uh, projects of this <clears throat> nature to uh, move forward in, in, in uh, phases. For example, uh, a, a very large concentrated poverty area in Norfolk, Virginia has 
three contiguous public housing properties with uh, 1,900 units, seven, I'm sorry, 1,700 units. And the first phase is the only one that's been uh, costed out and financed is, is uh, Tidewater Gardens with 618 units. And um, that got a HUD grant and it's gotten tax credit awards for three or four phases that are either under construction or, or in pre-development. So it, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to, um, to stage things as you go, because as, as, as your principles you're talking about here talk about it, you're, you're um, trying to keep some flexibility and things are gonna change with, with progress. You know, we, we had an interesting experience there where we were, we already actually had full uh, site plans and drawings and everything. When the mayor came in and said, you know, we have these people who want to build a, a, an arena where some of your plans are, what can you do to move things around and reshape things? So things just happen. So I, I think, I don't think, um, you know, it may, it may scare the housing finance agency to know the extent of what you're looking at and, and how many uh, uh, allocations of, of bonds that you're going to be looking for. But, uh, and we're going to have a, an upcoming meeting with them. We'll lay that out. Uh, <clears throat> I guess if they, if they tell us at that meeting, we have to know what your total plans are and what the total cost is going to be, we'll, we'll have to figure out how to respond to that. And I think that somewhat goes toward Dave's point also, uh, is that by the time we, and I'm calling it turn the corner and get over to the west side, the southwest side, near the light rail station, who knows who's going to knock on our door at that point um, and, and say, oh, they're, they're you know, all we, coming. We, yeah, that's right. We may want to build an office building here. So let's swap out something over in this part of the city that we own. Um, so we could do something commercial over here and and, uh, and, and get Dave's health clinic over there. Um, just as a director, just as a quick aside here, in the last week, I've been in three different meetings with three different developers and all three of them have referenced <laughs> those properties on that getting, side of the, on, on that side of the main campus. We're getting the word out. They would, rather thing, build, they would rather build near a light rail station, right? Well, they're, they're, huh? yes, but they're, they're also unreasonable in their requests. Yeah, well, uh, at least at this point, but that's course. how it always starts, Mike. I have yeah, I know. you to bring them down to planet earth. <laughs> so, but. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I agree. A it's, thing. A, it's a valuable, it's a valuable chit. And, you know, and, and right. especially because the, the street grid's going to, I mean, it's not just the property right next to the light rail. When we redo the street grid, it's going to open up those two properties directly to the north of the second street light rail too. So you're mm -hmm. going to have three properties to, to barter with. Mm -hmm. And, and I really think, I mean, it's, you know, we're only a mile square community. It's not going to be that much additional property, but if we get 20, if we get a 20% bigger piece of property, north of the viaduct, let's say, as an example, because that's the most undeveloped swath of Hoboken, right? Mm -hmm. If we get 20% more property, 20% more acreage, it both it both peppers and spreads out our population more so they don't feel like they're, you know, we're tacitly telling them they can only live in one part of town. And that's one. And two, we get a little extra land. So, sure. I mean, when yeah, in. yeah, but we, we, we still don't, you're making an assumption that yes, residents- that's very true residents don't want to live uh in the, in one area that they've called home for their entire lives yeah, but and the second not, assumption is, second assumption that you're making is that they want to live by by a duct maybe they don't maybe they don't want to live in a flood not really. I mean, point point well taken andrew but <laughs> how, is that that not an, how is that not an assumption we're talking about the final stages where we would be talking about potentially growth. Additional. So yeah. th this is this is not the current residence. We're talking about we're talking about additional capacity. We also added that in the survey. If people and we asked that question, if they would like that's, to live in different. That's so that's point, part Mark, of the upcoming. So that's part of the survey that we yep. just pushed out this week. So I think let's see what they say. We have to make sure we get enough people. That's to right. The we survey. need to get great point answers Erica. back. So. We need to get answers back and that survey done as soon as possible to see exactly what mm -hmm. our yeah, residents want. 
We're definitely working on that. And, and, yeah. and, and I've said all along, I want to ensure that we're going to replace our current units and that that's our current residents. So, you know, when we, when we talk about additional capacity, that becomes a city wide issue. Yep. Sure. All right, let's get to it. Let's see it. <laughs> all right. So I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Party Gallus here. And I'm going to stop my share. Oh, uh, but thanks for walking us through, Mark, Mr. Let me, let me make a comment, if I will, for a second, Mark. Uh, I've been taking notes on the changes that we would make in this uh, memo that you did on the 20th of January. And my comp my contemplation of what will happen after this meeting is that I will do another draft and I will make it into a resolution for consideration at the next regular meeting of the authority, subject to further changes based upon the rest of this discussion and what may happen during the next two weeks. The idea would be that these would then become additional, we'll decide what to call them, but for purposes right now, additional guiding principles added to the ones that we previously adopted last summer. And they would then constitute further guidance to the planning group in terms of their preparation of their final effort over the next two months. If anybody has a problem with that, at some point tonight, I'd like to hear about it because that is a large portion of what we're up to here, to give guidance to the planning group so that they can take the next steps. And although we're not going to take action tonight, the purpose is to get on the table any issues that arise from the January 20th memo so that they don't go in a direction which is not going to be consistent with what the board wants to do. Do, do we have the, the one page declaration that we went over back in June? Finalized, was that ever finalized and sent out? I, I asked oh, yes. the record. Or... Yes, yes, it was, uh, Commissioner Vistato. Absolutely. It was adopted um, by the board. Come on, boys. It is available. If... Sorry? And it's also published on our website. Okay, good. Um, that's, that's it, it was dated June 10th, at the June 10th meeting of the authority. I'm sure that Lords could send out additional copies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the answer to your question, Andrew, is absolutely, it's a public document that has been adopted. Thank you. And we, we reference it as the development principles. That's correct. Thank you. All right. You got me yeah. salivating over here. Yeah, I, I think without so further ado, because uh, uh, Harold said it best, uh, just the, you know, so we, we need everybody to be on the same page as we continue to put the document together. And I don't want to, I know Brian is itching to present it as well. And Mr. Russo, uh, uh, I'm not going to say anything more. Brian, take it away, please. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, can everyone see it? And can ever can someone just? Oh no. Yeah, I'm seeing just a black screen. Yeah, it's just a black screen right now. Oh boy. Um, is can Dave Stemple see? Um, can he can he share your screen, Dave? I've, I've been having. A, I apologize. I've been having a um, an issue with my screen sharing in this program. This is the second time this has happened. At the black and white issue again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I liked the green box earlier today. Yeah, I apologize. Um, Dave, it should just be the email that I sent out earlier. It's yep, yep. Mr. Apologies for that. Well, I just want I can, I can talk I saw this summer. Uh, I can talk uh, a little bit more. Um, okay, there we go. Great. Can everyone see the screen? Yep. Yes, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. I apologize for that. Um, so, you know, I. I <laughs> Apologies to Dr. Russo. This isn't this isn't going to be uh, groundbreaking in a in a new way necessarily, but uh, a new way of looking at kind of the site overall. And the idea is that, and, and I just want to say thank you for everybody to um, kind of 
especially the last uh, special meeting you guys had on the 13th. Um, it was very productive to kind of get these questions answered and for us to move forward. And so we took a look at that memo and, and all we wanted to do here is kind of uh, illustrate what, the, what those mean um, to the plan, right? And um, so I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna go through them like uh, Mr. Recco did earlier, um, especially the ones that kind of are about unit ranges. Those are, those are you know, very clear. Um, but we just wanted to talk about ways that we have, um, that we will start to communicate uh, these principles in the report and in future presentations to allow um, ultimate flexibility in the, the plan, right? So we, the, um, the idea is, you know, F1 in this, this is kind of just an overall diagram to, for tonight, but F1, um, thank you, Dave, is, um, you know, colored in the most saturated color right now, because that's kind of the, the clearest focus that we have, right? We can um, get co cost estimation for that. We can start understanding the scope of that building. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll speak more specific about that as we go on. Um, and then the, the buildings outlined in the red, uh, the red dash line kind of pertain to the um, issue number five from the memo of, of replacing units um, and housing only existing residents for the, the first few phases. So as we see it now, um, we, you know, we see that the first maybe three or four phases um, are, are within this, this realm of the red. And, you know, you can see that's kind of a critical mass of buildings to get residents in and really see a sea change of um, the perception of this community. Um, I think we're, all, we're still, um, you know, designing around Mama Johnson Field as the, the community hub and as the kind of the heart of, of the community. And so the buildings will take shape around there and, and create a, a great space, you know, within that. Um, so another big part about a kind of a switch that we're gonna be start to studying more now that we've kind of got some, this very clear direction and it was a very good idea to incorporate Christopher Columbus. Um, in our previous phasing plan, it was kind of brought in at the end and um, not necessarily contributed to the early phases, not contributed to getting um, some of the density off of Mama Johnson, um, sorry, off of Jackson Gardens, uh, you know, in the beginning to kind of distribute a little bit more. Um, so what, what the, the plan will go ahead forward with will be is to kind of use Christopher Columbus um, as, a, as an earlier phase to get uh, more units there, you know, which, which would be built in appropriately scaled buildings. You know, that area is already infilled a lot with these, these building types. And um, I think it would be, you know, appropriate to build the, those scales there, keeping, keeping the open space that we've talked about before, <laughs> but allowing for um, more units to be built there that, some, so that they can clear out space, especially around E1 and E2 and D. Um, to get those phases started and to get to get people um, you know moved into new buildings and so um, that's that's kind of a, a phase that's, that's a new kind of uh, strategy we're going to we're going to um, incorporate into the plan so that's I think it's a good one um, in, and then of course um, you know the Christopher Columbus residents that once they they, they will de need to be relocated temporarily when these buildings are built um, there's, uh, there's the plan is to have them actually, you know, um, housed in, in part of Jackson Gardens when F1 is built and, and people move into there first and they'll have the right to return um, back to their, to their um, Christopher Columbus at the end of the day. So that's, that's kind of a, a key principle that we'll repeat through. Um, the rest is, you know, and, and then essentially once we get started with F1 and, and E1 and E2 and D, which is similar to the last phasing study that we really presented, um, we'll get to a critical mass of, um, of buildings where we think a, a potential senior building on C can, can happen um, that can get uh, one, of, one of the senior buildings, um, the, the residents of one of the senior buildings, let's say Monroe Gardens in this case, can move to C to allow us to substantially renovate and rehabilitate um, Monroe Gardens and start that process, which is kind of a at that point, it would be a parallel process with the new construction, but at that point, it also allow for, um, you know, um, the seniors to move back there or more seniors to move in there as well, um, and also allow for Adams Gardens to to kind of move out and get uh, renovated as well. And then those two will, you know, will kick into the cash flow and, and kick it into the equity of of Q1 
keeping the um, the project sustainable in an economic manner. Um, so those are all you know that's the kind of the moves. Um, and then graphically, so the, the, the other thing is we just want to acknowledge we agree with um, you know a variety of building heights, a variety of building types, a variety of building um, facades, and in, in breaking it up to be more of a neighborhood. But along the building heights, you can see here we. We just, this is just for tonight, but we're illustrating um, additional height, potential height areas um, in this kind of translucent orange, um, you know, sometimes we call it a jello, right? It's kind of a, a clear volume and mm -hmm. showing that along um, the Palisades, along the kind of new um, resiliency park that's planned, um, there's potential for height, uh, for, certainly for taller heights along that edge that would, would be recommended by us I think would be an easy sell to the community as it's it's not uh, directly affecting any um, you know existing parts of the community, but also kind of steps down from the Palisades, and it also allows um, you know views a view shed from from the, that additional height to the rest of Hoboken and beyond. I want to interject. So, a quick correction: There's nothing that's an easy sell to this community. I just need okay, to yeah, e easier maybe is the term, um, and I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing. That either, but um, and then the other the other thought is just we're going to continue to study. But you know, obviously we, we were talking about earlier, but Block A being closest to the light rail station, closest to um, significantly taller buildings, is 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 um, a, an opportunity for for the tallest you know possibility of height. So it, it kind of ramps down from the Palisades down to the Hoboken um, to Jackson Street, but also you know Block A to Block D as as a potential strategy. Um, and we will be able to diagram these in a clear kind of separate manner to, to make that clear. Um, and then the other um, the other thing we're just doing, again, kind of thinking about focus and um, near-term focus versus long-term flexibility. And the idea of, of kind of um, getting specific about building F1 as, as the build first site, getting more specific about maybe the next few phases, E1, E2, D, um, and then as you go, you know, even graphically, we're trying to show it here, F2 and B2 are kind of, uh, uh, you know, lightened in this drawing, right? And G and A are even lighter and, and more uh, ghosted. We, we're calling it ghosted, but, you know, clouded out because that is, um, we don't want to focus on the architecture there, knowing that a lot of different things could happen, especially if there are um, developments outside of the, the housing authority property in the, in the mid to, to long-term future. Um, so those are just kind of some um, ways to just illustrate these issues, and they're, and then we're going to take these issues that are now you know gelling into being direction, um, and and we're happy about that, in in to to go forward with the plan, um, and and I think that's all I wanted to say. So does anyone have any questions? Um, and oh, the, the other thing is just the note that this is that you know is our baseline planning scenario, right, of um, how many units we can get. Um, and then, you know, the idea is people can start to visualize, um, well, if we want to have, you know, 5,000 units, whatever was thrown out earlier. There you go. Today, no, now you're uh, talking, Brian. <laughs> how, do you, how do you start to, 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 to accomplish that, right? You, you can start to accomplish that by, by building some of these buildings bigger, by, you know, moving pieces around. And that's, that's kind of the idea that it's not, that's not the plan. Um, the plan is more realistic, and then there are some some mechanisms to make that happen in the future. Uh, right, just talk about if I could jump in. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, just the phasing. Uh, how again? How we're going to incorporate Christopher Columbus into those beginning phases, as far as getting the residents from those buildings housed somewhere else? So I know the the potential first phase of F1 would house. Uh, the current buildings where E1 and E2 stand uh, yep. and those, those residents would move into F1. Um, how do you incorporate CCG into the next phase or do you incorporate it even into the first phase? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, and we're still studying it, but what, what it looks like is, so the, the cruise, you know, there's a cruciform buildings mm -hmm. on Christopher Columbus, right? They're, they're about 48 units, 49 units each. Um, one of the buildings that people will be moving out of on um, around E1 is that same exact building, uh, same unit mix, same same bedroom count, you know, the way that they're laid out, they're just replicated. 
Um, and then there are, there's an additional buildings in E2 that those people would move out of. And one thought is that um, the 98 or so people in Christopher Columbus, or, or maybe it's you know, broken into phases, you know, sub phases, um, right. could move to those buildings just until their buildings are built. And then the next phase would be you know, demolishing Christopher Columbus Gardens, building those up. Christopher Columbus residents could move back to those units. Uh, and then we would also add, you know, I think, you know, just to, just as an example, we'd add like 80 more units there. Um, yeah, and those 80 units would then start mm -hmm. to clear out uh, other other buildings and then we can start, you know, getting there. So, yeah, I, so I, I, I think you really have to really kind of move only one building, right? So it, it, it looks like that the way Christopher, Golum Christopher Columbus Gardens is presented in, in the picture, it looks mm -hmm. like one of those buildings could probably house everyone who's on that site now. Uh, so That's a good only, point. Yeah, so if you're only moving mm -hmm. one building and demolishing to build the newer building, I think once the newer building is completed on, on CCG, you could probably move both buildings into that first building and mm -hmm. then now you have a second building that could, could be underway. So almost like you said, a sub phasing of, of yeah. that one block. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So, so I don't think it would yield exactly double, but it's, it, you get to that point where you can then start getting a little more creative with options, right? Well, we, um, can, we can make sure it yields double. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, <laughs> if, if we're talking about as it stands there, what is that, six stories? Right. Yes. Right. I mean, if, if we could go a seventh story or even an eighth story and then have one, the, the second building smaller, right? Like they don't have to be huh? exact. Um, what you know, is the that, area the around there? The I'm sorry, Erica. No, I apologize. Is that a building you could go up to seven, eight or nine? It's eight. Or... What is it? Seven now. No? It's seven now. It's seven yeah. now. So could you go up to a nine? Would it match Absolutely. the other areas? Would it match the, the buildings in the look in the neighborhood where you're not going too high? I, yeah, I, I mean, think, I think, but you're yeah, getting more for your value. You're getting more to, to be able to move more people faster because I think people want to see us that we're moving, we're yeah. using our space efficiently. Sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think so. I think I think that's an easy sell. To be honest with you, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, it's the way you present it. It's the way people understand what the overall goal is, uh, and what the community with the with the surrounding neighborhoods going to look like so just the change of the building is going to enhance that neighborhood mm -hmm. the way we have the cut through in the middle of the block plus the additional open space uh in those c-shaped buildings you're going to have you're probably going to double the amount of open space you have there that's accessible not only to residents in the buildings potentially residents outside the buildings um you know I, I think you could sell that easy, Erica. I think that's an easy that's, sell. That's, that's a really that good. That's on. a really good strategy. I, and, and and I think we'll 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 take that into account. That's part of our our literally like the next thing to study. And um, and if we could present a solution that is a taller building there that gets everybody yep. moved in, um, or or a, some sort of you know partial you know other options. Sure. That would be a similar similar idea. Yeah, I mean uh, honestly, uh, there's. I mean, I look at that and I see 15 different options there that, that are all, yes. I think, viable and, and easily sellable to the surrounding community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, that, and that, goes back to the, that goes back to the earlier point that Aaron made about the timing of this. If you can make up half that time with that parcel, then, you know, th that, that saves us down the road a little bit more. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of options there. If I may, in terms of the title to that property, I should point out that all those parking spaces that are around the edge yes. are technically mostly the housing authority's property. That's not the street necessarily. Correct. Which means recreate... that when we dig in, sorry? You could recreate the block. Which yes, gives you more, exactly. Which gives we you need more some space. help from the city. Um, I will say Councilman Russo in this case, but there is definitely the opportunity. I've talked to Mr. Recco about that already, 
of expanding our footprint to reflect that parking, in yeah. which case the comment that we might be able to put all of the units into half of the location, I think is very workable. Yeah. So do I. Uh, just a full disclosure, we have, we've 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 already expanded those parking spaces in this current plan, but because yes, yeah, no, that's good. That's I'm, right. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. We've like already that. done what? We already we already assumed Fine. that we could. Uh, uh, Harold, we already assumed that we could grab those those spaces, knowing that it was on the land. We've we've I think you actually brought well, it up. Well, I think that I think then at some point, Susan, and perhaps if you're involved, you. Uh, we should talk about that because it's a little bit more complicated than assuming. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah. But yeah, I think we should, yeah. for purposes of tonight, operate on the assumption that we can draw the block right. to look like all the other blocks, and that's our property. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's right. And, that's right. And, and that's what we've presumed, for better or worse. We're a presumptuous right. crew sometimes. <laughs> all right, good. Like it. That was a that was a great uh, great question, uh, Dr. Russo. Thank you for bringing that. We'll we'll incorporate. We'll study that. Sounds good. Is it was there a reason why that wasn't thought about? Or did, um, it was, was there, it was, was already that... yeah yeah. So okay, so we're you know again we are and perhaps um, we should shake out of this a little bit, knowing the construction costs, but we. If you look at all the buildings around around there, they're all six stories um, for a, for an economic. I'll, I'll go ahead and say it because it's that was the cheapest way to build at the time, right? They probably would have tried to go taller if they could, or there's some you know there's some pressure to keep it at that level. So we were we were looking at these at this level, and we also are looking at realistic um, uh, you, you know replacement unit counts and things like that. But you know when, when we get the direction from um, issue number. Two, uh, the apartment size mix can be adjusted to account for current and under over house conditions. That allows us to get a little more specific on, on what could be replaced there. Um, especially if it's in an earlier phase, we can, we can get a little more um, realistic about that. And so that's, we were, we were being, perhaps we were being conservative uh, at the first pass, uh, but I know Dave, Dave Stemble brought that up. You know, we were talking about that as a, as a, um, as a potential option is just doing one or under two. Um, yeah, yeah, we had brought that up early in the process, as a matter of fact, and then came back around to the six story model. And so, so we've got some, um, you know, there's been some push and shove as, as this has developed. Um, and as we come back around to those ideas, I think we'll be ready to plug them in. Yeah, and, and it goes to just, I just want to summarize mm -hmm. the, when we start these baseline studies, we don't want to assume that we can do nine story buildings in a place that doesn't have any to start, right? We don't want it to blow up in our face immediately. So we try to get, uh, try to be as realistic and pragmatic as possible. But, you know, knowing, get, gathering more information about the possibilities is where we can then start injecting that, those plants. So that's kind of and, the process. That we and also we are here to hear your input on these diagrams. And just yeah. as Brian talked about um, using the, uh, Brian's phrase of sort of the, uh, the jello uh, mm -hmm. the see-through bit, we could certainly add that here as a concept and then run the scenarios and see about uh, how tall one of these would have to be to, to replace all the units. And we can bring that option back to you. And uh, well, yeah. the part, the point that I just want to add too is that, you know, we were also the six story base limit I just want to say that this also was a result of meetings that the design team had early on with, with the stakeholders. And in particular, I'm talking about the stakeholders that are residents um, of the current uh, housing authority property. And that's where we heard uh, the comment of, well, we want to have building types that are just like the surrounding context area. And you know, if we see six story there, why can't we have six story? And so that was also us listening to uh, the comments that we heard uh, and then just starting again with that six story height as a base. Yeah, well, we'll also take into account, um, you know, the very realistic pressure of um, parking and, you know, the taller you go, the less parking uh, sure. you provide per unit. And, and 
you know, Christopher Columbus is much further away from a transit stop than Jackson, you know, to make the argument that you could go lower. So th these are the things that we, we weigh when we, we make these the decisions. Understood. Okay. Thanks. Good question. Uh, another good, great question. So keep it going. In phase one, um, we're talking about any retail ground floor. Um, that wasn't, I don't, I don't think I that's don't, part of it, right? Yeah, the, the nature of that building in particular, um, you know, we, we want to get a good lobby. There might be some space um, left over for an amenity. Uh, we were trying to get some parking in there to, to make that real, acknowledging that we're actually taking a parking lot away from the project, right? And mm -hmm. we're going to have to figure out some, some excess land to, yeah. to do that too, um, to, to replace that stuff. But that was kind of part of it. Um, but, you know, once again, once we, um, once this plan goes ahead and, and that building becomes, you know, in the, in the next couple of years when this is forward, you know, the architects, you guys will take another snapshot of that and see uh, what's available, what's, what's realistic in that, in that sense. But at the moment, I don't think we were placing any retail uh, there, like commercial space there. Uh, gotcha. Just to be, again, kind which, of uh, which makes sense to me anyway. So it's yeah, yeah, it's fine. I just want to put it out there. Um, and you know, if you remember our our um, kind of the the urban design diagram we presented last time, kind of the overall site, the we were thinking closer to the light rail station, perhaps on Third Street. You know, as a kind of a corridor that that would kind of um, capture mm -hmm. everything. You know, th there might be some opportunity in the earlier phases to provide some some daily services uh, for you know, acknowledging that there's going to be a lot of residents around Mama Johnson Field. Um, you know, those are things we can talk about. As we go forward. Yeah, I, 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 just for me, I mean, just and I know the phasing is far away, but F2 seems like a more uh, appropriate uh, ground floor retail, mm -hmm. especially because it would be right across from more ground floor okay. retail. Uh, I think exactly. that makes sense. And then yep. even potentially uh, ground floor on E1 uh, might make some sense. Um, at least the uh, portions of the building that are facing Mama Johnson. So not even on the street side. Yes. Uh, maybe, you know, a smaller little kind of cafe or a corner store kind of type of thing. You know, you're at Mama Johnson Field and, you know, your kid's tugging on your shirt and he wants a soda and a bag of chips you know <laughs> yeah you know, we, we uh like frozen frozen yogurt uh, yeah, shop sure. or kill there right yeah. it's the, it's the eyes on the park concept too which is yeah yeah activating the park that's right mm -hmm. that's right and oh. you know um that's something that we haven't talked about a lot but i think we want to explore a little bit in the next few weeks is just um the potential for mama johnson field you know um i think it'll it'll want to include a lot of resident input that we're we're proposing expanding it slightly um, towards building C, right? From what it currently is, the the, the um, headquarters uh, building will be, you know, moved to one of the ground floors of one of these buildings. So, you know, what what, is, what can Mama Johnson Field become um, larger than it is now? You know, mm -hmm. is it more flexible uses? Is it um, you, you know different types of playgrounds, different uh, freight, different age groups? That kind of thing, um, but I think it's a very important piece that we've been um, not addressing directly because of all of these these programmatic uh, questions. But we, we won't be discounting that in the final report. Awesome, I love that. Yeah, and if I can just add about uh, Mama Johnson Field and just all of the open spaces, this is where, um, to Brian's point, this is where it'll be looking at the bigger picture of just the outdoor amenities and how they tie together to create a, a place. Uh, because you're also going to have along the uh, Palisades, uh, the resilience uh, area uh, that we're planning there. So again, that's going to be, you know, serve a dual role, as well as an amenity as, you know, addressing or helping to assist in addressing, uh, addressing some of the flood conditions uh, that currently exist in the area. Here, I, I got a great get back at people for uh, treating our housing authority like an afterthought. Put a put a housing authority exclusive outdoor pool there. 
Yeah, there's room for well, some room commotion for those in the courtyards too. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can store a lot of uh, rainwater there too. <laughs> you gotta, gotta make, be one make, of our make it a salt water pool. Okay. Uh, I have a question on the um, senior buildings as well. Sure. The, are those additional buildings, uh, not the renovated portion, but the mm -hmm. additional portion, is that happening in phase one as well? I think it would happen. Um, or close know, when, to when, phase one. Yeah, maybe not. It would happen when they would be substantially renovated. I, I don't know if it would make sense to disrupt that's our current thinking that's something we can look into but um you know they're they're, they're meant to offset the um when we renovate those senior buildings the right. the current one you'll lose a lot of studios it's the you know you can't build studios anymore so you'll end up um losing some units and those were those were the thought of those would be kind of recapture some of the um the units on the same side so it's kind of like yeah, a, yeah, no, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, are, are those are those buildings being built and then the residents are being moved into those newer portions and then the older portion gets renovated or is it is it different? Almost like there's a, a, a phasing within yeah. the site itself. Um, yeah, so I think sorry, this is Shannon. So I think, Brian, when you explained it to us earlier, Mm -hmm. It seemed like the elderly building would go up maybe as part of like phase three or four. Christopher Columbus would come first. And then the and then senior building would go up. And then the residents from Monroe or Adams, whichever goes first, once the senior building is built, mm -hmm. they would move over to this senior building either as temporary or permanent relocation, whatever they want to do. Like if they want to go back to their original Monroe or Gardens once it's rehabbed, then mm -hmm. they can do that. So does that help a little bit? Well, it, yeah. it, it helps a little bit, but I'm gonna, I'm going to make a suggestion. Um, I personally, again, going back to the concept of getting our housing authority residents in other areas of the city. I love getting some seniors onto our main campus. At the same time, I would love to get some of our family units at potentially one of the senior sites. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, those grayed out buildings are the newer portions. The, the blue buildings um, are the old buildings, actually. That's the, the tower. Existing. So it's existing. reversed, I'm sorry, correct. Yeah. So, so you have- so, uh -huh. The other ones were kind of these, you know, um, infill portions that um, would would just kind of offset the loss if it was a senior building. Now, that being said, let's say, um, you know, Monroe moves to building C and then Adams moves to Monroe after that's substantially renovated. Then Adams, in theory, doesn't have... You know, I don't think the seniors in C would move back there necessarily. We were, we were, we understand that your population is aging, and there are a lot of you know demand for perhaps another senior building. Mm -hmm. But you know, maybe maybe a couple of years down the line, it it changes a little bit, and that um, maybe when you start to think about what Adams is, it becomes something else. So you know, a, a mixed building. Uh, sure. You know, so that that's a possibility, and then I guess that would be. It might change the unit mix there, but mm -hmm. um, so so you think that the the additional buildings on those two senior sites really just offset the change from studios to one bedrooms. Yeah. yeah. And I think the concept was understood. While, while we're doing the substantial renovation in the existing building, the new buildings go up at that same time. Right. Correct. Okay. Right. I got you. Right. Right. Now, I just wanted to understand. I, I was hopeful that we might be able to swing more units. And yeah, know. yeah, we looked at that, and you know, honestly, the the both sites are not um, square sites. Yeah. And you know, if you could get a couple properties in the corner, um, you know, one of them actually is a is a parking lot, but I think it's owned by the Catholic Church, um, a Catholic Church. You know, you could then see more efficient buildings there. Um, 
that would get more units. But we were, again, just trying to kind of understand. be realistic on that. Yep. No, I understand fully. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Do we have, um, you walk us through like an accurate timeline here? Um, I don't know if I can, but does anyone else want to? Is this, is I, this a, and maybe it's not, a, maybe it's not the right time to be asked. Yeah, I would say we want to get towards that, but I think we want to provide you with a good, a better, more accurate version um, as we go forward. But, you know, there, I know Susan and, and John from Higher Gruel are, um, are more expert in the, in the New Jersey state processes and especially the, the approval processes, both in Hoboken and the state of getting this um, plan plans approved, you know, it takes, takes time. And then um, beyond that, it's, it's about financing and things like that. So I, I personally don't, can't speak to it, but does anyone else want to add on to that? No, I, I think that that's, that's correct because it's just so, so many other factors, but I, I you know, I think as you get further along, um, you can probably give some very, very rough estimates, but the other, you know, factors, Brian, that you've thrown in there is just the timing of bringing on, you know, how you want to develop this. Is this in conjunction with a private developer? Um, as Brian had also mentioned, the funding and how you how you just move forward with these, uh, with this process. And then the other indicator that just looms out there from time to time is just how the economy acts. So, um, you know, that's also going to play into it. And re remind me, do we need to, uh, from the city's perspective, do we need to do a redevelopment zone here? Uh, I, uh, yes. Yes. So let me comment on that. It, yeah, please. If the authority is going to have the maximum amount of flexibility to achieve all of these goals, it would be very beneficial for the authority to have a redevelopment or multiple redevelopment plans for all of its locations. That is something that the authority as an entity would want to have if it could. Okay. And that so, is something that the planning people have contemplated all along that they would want to do. Okay, so uh, from, let me let me interject. Go ahead. An area, Councilman. An area in need of rehabilitation designation too. Uh, if you do an area of, of redevelopment, you don't need the rehabilitation. Yeah, but I mean, rehabilitation, it just gives the assurances to people that we're never going to, that, that it's going to be used for what it's used for. Rehabilitation. Oh, you could, you could yeah. yeah, you could do a non-condemnation. Um, so there, well, that's, there's that's different why, That's why I say it. rehabilitation instead of rehabilitation. Yeah. It so takes you could do a non-condemnation uh, re, uh, redevelopment area. Uh, which would assure the same thing, uh, which gives you the ability then to go into a longer term pilot, which is probably what we want to talk about for funding of this site. Uh, you can also do a redevelopment plan, which will give you the envelope. Uh, and, and what I would suggest is probably do four different plans, one with the main campus, one for each of the senior buildings and then one for CCG um, and do that in the form of a, of a non-condemnation uh, re, uh, redevelopment plan. Um, and we can make those plans pretty, uh, pretty flexible to, to, to give us the ability to build what we want and have the, the flexibility in some of the shifting things that, that are going on. Um, I, Again, put my council hat on. I think I could. I think if that's the plan, again for time's sake, we should start having those conversations because I would love to get those plans in place before we do anything. Right? Like we could start working on those plans with the community development director and our head of housing, uh, Vanessa Falco, and get that before the council probably within the next quarter, if we really move quickly. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, I look back, Mike, at the, um, the whole New Jersey transit situation, and mm -hmm. the city took the, the stance that it was best to um, 
even though it was a state agency that owned the property, that it was best to do a designation of an area, I believe it was a rehabilitation. It wasn't like we were ever going to condemn the land of New Jersey Transit, right? But there yeah. was a, and then when you have a designation of an area in need of rehabilitation versus redevelopment, you take condemnation in most scenarios off the table and you, you still do the redevelopment plan and then you don't have to adhere to the underlying zoning because you have yeah, the, the only problem with that is then you're, then you're limited with your, what your pilot which we may need for, for funding. But you're, you're always limited with pilots, so anyway. Yeah, but 10 years and 30 years is very different. Oh, so in rehabilitation, there's a, there's a lesser Only pilot. 10. I think the yeah, max is 10. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. so, so that would be... And, 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 so, and sorry to bog everybody down with this. I apologize. I'm just thinking... I'm, I'm just... I got my other hat on there for a minute. Sorry. Yeah, but but it's good. Necessary. It's necessary, Mike, because we're not, we're not, we don't have some special status as a landowner to just ignore zoning laws. So right. Right. it's true. That we understand that, you know, yeah. we, we can't just and, do whatever right. the heck we want. Yeah. And the, and the I don't know is, about the rest of the, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I don't know about the rest of the folks on this call, but this is not something that I find bogging down eventually. This is absolutely crucial for the authority yeah. to move forward. The planners have been told that they should prepare a framework for the overall redevelopment effort, whatever documents they're going to be. Yep. Let's just say it's going to be redevelopment plans for various locations. Right. But in order to actually get to the point of having the power to do a lot of the things that the authority wants to do, for example, being a redevelopment entity so that we can pick partners it would be very important for us to move as soon as the first effort is done here in the direction of the city who's going to have to guide us is what we can do on these plans. I will so literally I agree start completely this conversation. That, that it's an important discussion. I will start this conversation as early as tomorrow morning. Yeah, and we've, we've, will... we've had meetings with the uh, city on this already, right? I mean, we've, you know, we're, they're aware of our Oh yeah, they're absolutely the aware. But I want to move that. I want to move yeah. that from awareness to action, right? Like I want. Yeah. I want our professionals from the city's perspective to start looking at the um, what the plan needs to look like. What that that maximizes Excellent. our flexibility, maximizes our maximizes our pilot situation. Uh, have the ability to kind of move as, at a at a warp speed, uh, so that the city is not slowing down. The authority at any point right if we need if yeah. we as an authority have to step on the brakes for something i want us to be able to make that decision not have it the other way around where the city's holding it up so that's, um, a, that's an excellent point yeah i will i will speak to uh vanessa falco and director brown um tomorrow probably before the afternoon so i'll i'll get that ball rolling as fast as possible and we do have a meeting uh, with our planners in the city planning group and the mayor on uh, on next Tuesday as well that we've got set up. So that's perfect timing for you awesome. to have those conversations in anticipation of our meeting Tuesday. Awesome. That works. Yes, it does. Music to my ears. Very good. Can we, can we get it? Can we can we kind of sum up what what the next? Because I'm a little, you know, uh, forgive me, but it does seem like uh, not that we're disorganized, but a lot of open ended things here. We've been going at this for a little bit now. I'm real, I'm I'm kind of uh, not concerned, but you know, what, can someone give me a clear picture of our our next steps here and, and where we're going? This meeting tonight seemed a little similar to the last time we met with you guys, um, at least in my eyes. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at a very similar picture and talking about a lot of the similar stuff. Good points brought up by uh, Councilman Ru Russo to add to the flavor here, but uh, we're not really getting any more design pictures and buildings, and we still don't have a survey done by the residents. And Stuff's like lagging. It's starting to lag a little bit. and. Uh, we're not, I'm not seeing a lot of deliverables and getting things done quicker. Uh, let me remind everyone, these, these buildings are 
falling down, right? Right. We all know that. And I think we should get a, I don't know, just, I think the speed of this should be going. And now, now we're, we don't even know if we need to have redevelopment. We need to get that going. Uh, funding, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of open-ended questions about funding and total cost and whether or not the New Jersey agency is going to require that or not. So can someone kind of put this all back into a uh, good momentum forward here and kind of lay out a nice little uh, six month vision? So I think it was, it was really crucial. I think the, the reason we wanted to do some repetition tonight, Commissioner, was to make sure we, we agreed on these next development principles that we had, that, that, that we all agree as a board that we can come to the next board meeting and publicly pass these in a resolution format, which does a couple of things. It puts us uh, closer to finishing our plan. Um, it, 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 it then indicates agreement on the board and it gives direction to our planners to start polishing off the plan. Um, I, I think that that's just been crucial. These are some of the final questions we need uh, before the plan can be finalized. So I, I think it was important to do some repetition here tonight to make sure everyone understands where we are and what we agree on. We agree on the six story for the first building. We agree on um, the one for one replacement. We agree that our residents are going to be moved first. Those are those are really crucial things to do. So once that is that is in place, our planners have four to six weeks uh, to start putting together the final plan and give us the draft. Um, so, so we're getting really close to having that, that plan out there um, and, and to be giving you a, a draft of that. Um, oh, just by, just the, by nature the nature of, 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 yeah, I'm getting some feedback. Just by the nature of this, once we have that plan in place, the board is then committed. We have stated what we want to do. We then officially are approaching the city um, on which direction we want to go. Uh, with some of the discussions that we're with Chairman Mello and, and, and Dr. Russo right now on whether we do a redevelopment zone or whether we do an area in need of redevelopment. We're obviously having conversations ahead of time with that. Uh, by the way, the resident survey has been published. It's on our website now. Um, so we will have the results of that resident survey. Our deadline is February 20th to have the results back, but you can get on our website now. Uh, we did all the flyers, uh, they're being distributed. Is there any incentives for that speak. survey? Uh, no, there's no incentive. Like, like we're gonna give you five bucks if you, if you fill it out. No is, there, um, is there a certain amount of survey respondents that we require in order for us to even consider it? No, we haven't set up any, at this point, we haven't set up any so, minimum requirement for responses. I think I it's important they were getting to a free, do... I, I thought they were getting a free uh, session with you, Andrew, for basketball. <laughs> um, so Monday's, Monday's resident meeting, we had uh, like, I don't know, a handful of residents on the call. Mm -hmm. um, so I... You know, I think we have to really push the boundaries here and creatively figure out a way to get as many respondents as possible. And we can't accept, you know, if we get 21 respondents back, that that's a survey, right? Um, sure, sure. Then we're going to have to. Redo I think it. you would agree with that. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think our Andrew, PR, we're really rolling out our PR on this. Yeah, Barbara. Andrew, I spoke to the director. One of the things that Hopes has. Um, said that we would do is, as you know, we see a lot of the residents come to us, whether it's to use the computers or for any services that we use. So while they're coming into our office, once we assist them, we, we are going to be asking them to please take a moment and complete the survey. If it's an elderly person that comes in because we do see a lot of elderly, then we will assist them with it, um, with making sure that, they, you know, that it's completed. Um, what I have not seen, um, director, is I haven't seen the flyer. And to be honest with you, I wasn't even aware that it's on the on the actual website. A Nick still hasn't gone out about it being on the website. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to do better with advertising it. I think we should also, all of us, I know um, um, Erica, I know you do it. I know Michael, I know you, you probably do it on YouTube, but we have to also use our personal um, social medias to kind of get the word out there to, to for the people 
live down here to say, listen, guys, take a minute and, and, and fill it out because that's the only way you're going to get these people to do it unless we did a door to door thing and, and have them completed. Is that an option? Mm -hmm. Sure it is. Yeah, I, I, if I could, I was I was actually thinking if we gave it a couple of days to see what kind of response we got back. And then because it's going to be specific to where it's coming from, we can then do a final sweep just floor to floor, because I think that yeah. what Shannon did with the with the presentation, uh, I was actually going to speak to you guys about this. I think it would be I think it would be very beneficial for each building to be approached floor by floor like we did when we converted from Brad. Um, we had a floor by floor meeting where we actually had all the tenants come out to the lobby of each floor. They signed their new lease, but kind of something like that where we make it mandatory. They have to come to the front, yeah. explain them really quick, the uh, like in a nutshell of Shannon's presentation, and then have them fill out the survey. And we can get we can get 100 percent participation if we make it part of like that's what we expect of them. Yeah, we can get yeah. that done. Great idea. Great idea. Sounds good. So, so just to get back to you, so four to six weeks, uh, planners will have a final version for us for our review, correct? Yeah, that's our plan at this point. Troy, how, how are you feeling about that statement? Yeah, I would say, um, <clears throat> yeah, because uh, I feel like we've walked away, or we will walk away with uh, the direction we need. Um, you know, as, as long as there's not something that comes up later on that just throws a, a bridge in it. But yes, the, the goal is four to six weeks from now, um, as we continue to move forward, we, we would have that draft document for your review. Be, to be able to re review and vote on a draft document in March, correct? That, that's, our, that's our goal. Well, certainly the okay. March then, 10th Housing Authority meeting, I would contemplate that the plan as produced by the planners would be available for the authority. The discretion is still with the authority board as to whether or not they would then sanction it at the March meeting. But if it's acceptable, it would be very helpful if we could do that. Right, so walk, can you walk me through that? So let's just say March 10th, we, we approve that plan. What's, what's the next step? Um, I, I just think that it goes back to what Mr. Recco was saying. Um, from there, it's going to be, you know, whatever uh, uh, city planning redevelopment process uh, that you're going to have to go through as, as, an, as your next step. And at, at some point, we have to bring on developers and architects to yep. Correct. Show what the campus will will look like. These are renderings that will show us how we get capacity in the buildings and on the campus. Mm -hmm. right. And remember, these are these are block renderings that you're looking at right now, right? When when we have yep. when we have architects and 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 developers in the room, this these block buildings are going to look very different. Very <laughs> come alive. They're going to come yeah, alive. Yeah, they 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 it's truly do it. And it's we have visual exercise. It's just yeah, and 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 honestly, we have. I mean, there's a there's a ton of of people who could help on this project uh, as we move along. So, I'm I'm excited about this. I'm more excited every okay. day. Yeah. What's um? What's a what's a estimate of time in your in your other projects? The between the redevelopment and um, city you know, agreements and then getting the developers and architects. In. Yeah, that, that, that varies. I got to be honest with you. I'll, I'll give you, no, I'll give I'm, you the, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the, 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 the experts in the room here. The oh, partners. I thought you meant Hoboken. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think Jaime and I can speak to that. Um, this is Shannon. So basically once the board decides on a path forward, um, at that point, they're going to want, because there's procurement, rules involved here with the housing authority. Um, they'd have to put out an RFP for a development partner. Um, and so that process would probably take, oh gosh, uh, 120 days maybe to find a development partner, maybe a little bit longer. Mm. Um, uh, Shannon, I, I think we have to make clear too that not every phase of this will be done at the same time. 
Correct. Right. So that's you, the reason so, why yeah. we prioritize building F1, and certain of those RFPs will happen before others. Mm -hmm. We're thinking of it as a constant iterative step here. The first ones could start this year, and it'll also include uh, RFPs with respect to financing assistance. Uh, but we are going to be at the process of selecting people and moving forward on issues for quite some number of years here. I think you can assume the rest of this decade. Mm. <laughs> it's a safe yep. bet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so for the initial phase, I mean, the idea is that you would put out an RFP for someone that could potentially help you with the first several phases. It doesn't make sense to have a different development partner for each phase. Um, but that development partner will take the lead on doing all of the third party um, reports that need to be done, hiring the architect, everything's in conjunction or in um, collaboration with the housing authority, but they're, we're just like at the very beginning of this process. So right. once there's a, a an approved sort of this is how we're moving forward, then there's a whole bunch of other steps that goes with hiring a development partner and all of the third party folks that go along with that. Sean, I have a question for you. Um, yep. Do we have the ability to hire multiple development partners? Um, yeah. Not yes, an, yes, well, do. you do, but you wouldn't do that initially. Like that's, I don't know. Well, I think what Chad is saying is that if we hired somebody to do the initial phases, Right. That are very much meshed. We probably would want to have one development partner. But right. the answer to the right. commissioner is eventually, yes, very much so. We can hire right. different development partners. We can hire different architects. We can mix and match as we go forward and we Good. learn. Yeah. Because, again, just because the, um, the phasing outside of the main campus, we may want that running on, the, on parallel tracks. Mm -hmm. um, and having two different development partners might be a, a smart idea. Uh, and then again, it might not, I don't know, but uh, I just want to be able to keep my options open. And, and if we can, great. It's, it's, yeah, well, the first I mean, thing I'm gonna be concerned about is whether or not any development partner can <laughs> deal with an entire package. And I think you're gonna find the answer is no matter how big they are, this is going to be a very big project, and you don't want to put all of the eggs in one developer basket. Yep. Uh, I've been through too many issues with performance bonds, no matter how big they are, to uh, want to rely upon one outfit if it gets bogged down. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of there's a lot of just design and aesthetic things that would would support that as well. That you want to get more than one person on board because you yep. know the 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 vision for how this is going to look is is better off if you if you're looking for variation uh, uh, you, you know it's better off having other eyes looking at it right sure but, you know i i want to remind everybody we we want nobody to get displaced which means we have to get f1 going right before we can get the ball rolling i mean f1 is the is the initial component that has to happen before this thing really gets moving because then nobody gets let, let me comment on Coming on how we approach um, multiple buildings being redeveloped at the same time in other um, large scale redevelopments. So we, we look at when, when the given phases will close and we look at the uh, annual turnover rate of residents and we back up how many months, we figure out how many months it's going to take to get a third of the units vacant, let's say you're gonna do a renovation at, at one of the senior buildings, uh, how many units do you need to have vacant in order to turn over a third of the units to a developer? So you could have a rehab going on that didn't require you moving residents to another location at the same time that you're tackling your, your F1 uh, building, just as an example. I'm not suggesting that pairing, but uh, that's the kind of thing uh, that uh, is frequently done. Uh, Baltimore is a good example. They went out for 
uh, they did a pre-qualification for developers and then the secondary RFP process, they assigned one or two properties to each developer. And I think they had five or six projects going on simultaneously. Now that they, they were separate locations and how you have to really figure out how you're gonna handle the relocation without having to relocate people to private properties off site. Uh, that's more challenging for you than it is for a lot of other authorities. So, so those are some issues that could go into how you would sequence project and get potentially get some multiple projects getting worked on at the same time by one or more developers. Got it. Love it. I have a question and um, I know you guys spoke earlier about maybe making the op more open space towards where the Mama Johnson field is and so forth. I was thinking, has anybody thought about making an sort of like, like a recreation center on the housing property, meaning like having indoor basketball courts, um, um, making it, you know how now we have community rooms across the housing authority, maybe making it in the, that same center where it could also be used as a community room. It could be rented for meetings. Um, have, have we thought about something like that? Because I know we have a basketball court now, but it's outside. So winter comes, kids are not playing. And I know that the city has their center across the street, but let's be real, how often are our residents allowed in there to play? Um, yeah, th thanks, Barbara. I just I just want to say, yeah, we, we've we considered it in our kind of our larger urban design diagram. We kind of located, you know, potential spots for amenity. We call them amenity spaces, but it would that, that could take the form of a um, kind of a site, uh, you know, community room or community center. The the bottom of, of um, building C, uh, you know, in my mind would be a great one because it's on the park. There's not, you know, currently not a street in front of it. So you could see that spilling out and having events kind of um, indoor and outdoor. Um, and, and that would also have a, you know, that building has an opportunity to have much lower parking demand being being a senior building. Um, so yeah, we've, we've looked at it and that was a big part, uh, a lot of really good feedback we received from um, the, the, the multiple resident meetings we have attended, including the, the two big ones in person. Um, that, that was a huge feedback that we we really liked hearing um, the need the need for that kind of stuff. And then my next Fair question idea. is when when we were discussing Christopher Columbus, that's a whole block, right? Yep. So I Michael, I'm kind of thinking like 770. I know that's not a whole block. That's obviously more blocks. But right. if we if we had the ability to move those people and just build even obviously we wouldn't be able to build like 770 that big, but build big enough where we're able to, to put everyone back in there and then add additional um, apartments. Is that something that you guys? Yeah, yeah that's the plan. That, yeah. And, and Barbara, to, to your point, I mean, that's exactly what uh, specific to that one block, that one site, I see like the amenity spaces in those two buildings as, as, depicted there, I think will be huge in comparison to what's there now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you could put so much for the residents just on that block that is, you know, I mean, because it's a satellite type of a, of a building, but back to the main campus, I mean, when I look at that whole project, I mean, building C for me is the it's like the main hub, at least the way I envision it, right? I think our offices should be there as far as the housing authority. I think there should be event spaces there for our residents, larger event spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, each building could have it its own as well. But, you know, if somebody wants to, you know, do a party for their son's first birthday, uh, you know, and they want to invite a, a hundred people, well, I, I think we should have some some spaces for that, right? Um, like like a lot of the other buildings all across Hoboken. Um, mm -hmm. And to Dave's point earlier, you know, why why can't we talk about potentially putting a pool in for our residents? I mean, I, mean, I think those are things that if you find the right development partner, 
and you and you can maximize those sites, you can offer those amenities to our residents, which I think is sorely needed. And and that's what I envision. That's why, you know, those those buildings, especially along the Palisades, I'd love to put some height there because I think that yields us more in terms of what we could give back to our residents in terms of our sustainability as an authority. I mean, those are all the things that, you know, developers all across Hoboken, they build bigger. Why? Because it makes them more money, right? It allows them to give more back to the city because we, we require it as a city. So you need to look at it from the same perspective. And, and the beauty of it is we own the land, right? That's our, that is our ace in the hole, so to speak. So I'll get off my soapbox, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have one last question, and I don't think we've touched on this, but I had a resident ask me just recently about it. Uh, being once we move, once all this redevelopment starts and people start moving, they were thinking, well, what's going to happen? Um, like right now, we don't pay the light and electricity. Um, yeah, electricity and gas. We don't pay that. So they're like, well, once we move to this, is that going to be our responsibility? And to be honest, I was kind of stuck. I didn't know what to say because that I don't think that's something that we really discussed. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Is it going to stay the same way, um, you know, where they don't see a difference? Or is it somehow going to be incorporated into their rent? I don't know. I don't know. Can someone explain that? Yeah, I can um, give it a shot. Yeah, Shannon. Because <laughs> I, <can't. laughs> yeah. I think there's some choices to be made here. As we well, yeah. So right. utilities are always mm -hmm. a complicated subject, but mm -hmm. so so we're going to convert from public housing to Section Eight, right? And mm -hmm. so under both programs, with the exception of flat renters. Um, the resident is expected to pay 30% of their income. Here, I'll put my camera on so you can see me. 30% mm -hmm. um, of their adjusted gross income towards rent and utilities. Mm -hmm. So again, it's hard to explain, but right now your utilities are included. So every month you send a check to the housing authority for 30% of your adjusted gross income, basically. Mm -hmm. um, if there were a switch in the responsibility for who pays the utilities, um, they would incorporate what we call a utility allowance. And so it's kind of like what the average person would pay for utilities. And that's part of the calculation of what you pay. So if you're responsible with your utilities, you still are gonna pay 30% of your adjusted gross income for rent and utilities. It's kind of the easiest way I can explain it right now, but- um, Well, that, that was the question because they were on the meeting and they said, well, we're talking about how we're switching from, from section nine to section eight and section eight voucher holders do pay for their own electricity. Like, well, they, I, I think they get an allowance from that from from housing. Yeah, correct. So we should make a so we should pay. Yeah, so we should make a note at the next resident meeting to kind of explain that a little bit better. We don't know what the end result is going to be, but the intention is that it would remain consistent with what's going on right now. But it would not require an additional payment from the right. resident. So right. if the resident. If a decision is made to have the residents pay their own utilities, then they pay less rent to the authority, right. the same right. amount that they would be paying for their utilities, basically. <laughs> so, right, the check that you pay to the housing authority would be less because now you're paying your own utilities. Gotcha. So, I think Sharon explained it very well. The only problem with Shannon's explanation <laughs> is the lurking little issue of what happens if you've got somebody that really likes it hot or goes out yeah. all the time and leaves <laughs> their lights on. It is theoretically possible that the actual amount that they would have to pay would be in excess of those calculations because the calculations are all based upon a utility allowance based upon average uses. Right. And you will find that some people will exceed the average usage. I, I, I and that happens in public housing where 
where if they have sub-metering, for example, and, and the authority gives a utility allowance and tenants exceed that, then the authority bills them for the overage that they went over their utility allowance. So it puts right. more response. Other public housing authority units, that's not what our current circumstance is. So our tenants would be surprised with that. Uh, understood. <laughs> but I'm just I'm just saying that that uh, that that is um, a reality in many it's, housing yeah. authorities. In other places. The point yeah. is Barbara's mm -hmm. point, which is that's not a, their current expectation. Mm -hmm. Well, right. I, I mean, the, the assumption here also is that the new buildings are more efficient. I'm sure there's ways to build in uh, some safeguards, um, you know, uh, different types of uh, lighting and, and on and off switches and, you know, things like that. I mean, you know, I just think about my time in Portugal, with my wife, right? Like, I remember being in a hotel room, I could put I could put my lights on until I put my key card in a slot that activated my you know my electricity in my room right like so there are ways to really combat what the concern is but but to the overall point is we we need to submeter every unit right we have to know what each individual resident is using uh one way or the other whatever, however that that shakes out and then the other side is is making sure we have built into our buildings those um those safeguards as much as possible, you know. So, yeah, the as whole well as the no, green. No question. Barbara makes an extra excellent point, though. There's no question. This is going to be a practical yeah. change for folks. I'll and go. we need to anticipate that for sure. I'll go. I do. And I think we need to also start. I know that we're consistent. Nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change. Everything is still going to be the same. But obviously, this right here is an example of things not being the same, that people mm -hmm. who really live here are not used to doing this. Right. So now, I think what we have to start doing is incorporating it when we're educating them about this project. It's saying, listen, yes, you may, um, we, it's not decided yet, or there is a possibility that you may be responsible for, for your, um, you know, your light and in your gas yeah. and i mean there's That's a lot the of programs point. that help individuals that you know of the income of that income that you know mm -hmm. that would help it um sure. but again it's about educating them and letting them know because they're gonna be yeah i could see yeah, that the biggest point i've taken away from this meeting and um i didn't know that i, I did not know that that was the case so thank you barbara for, for asking that question yeah. Actually, thank the resident because to well, be honest with the other resident, I didn't even think about it because every, everything that was being said was everything's going to stay the same. So in my head, it's like, well, everything's going to be stayed the same. That's what made me the question today. Can I, I thought can I they brought process? this up once before. I remember this conversation from a, a prior meeting, and I believe we I've talked never about heard this. It. Yeah. Never heard it. Never heard it. Unless well, it, it was a lot of also the chance a lot that of we'll have electric heat. Sorry, I was going to say it takes a lot of repetition and a lot of education to go through the process. And um, you know, when when I think when when anybody has said that things aren't going to change, they're mostly referring to the percentage of the income that residents will pay for their housing costs, including rent and utilities, which so far utilities have been included in the rent. And now that may get bifurcated to where there's a payment for the utilities separate from payment to the rent, but the total will be the same 30% of, of the residents. Your rent income. will be the same 30%, but then now you're adding an additional bill. I no, understand no, what you're saying. No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 you're not understanding, Barbara. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry. Let them explain again. So you pay $100, Barbara, let's say for rent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in that rent currently, there is a charge associated with your utilities. Mm -hmm. The new way would be, let's say $80 of that is for your rent and then, uh, or, or $70 of that is for your rent and then $30 of that is for your utilities or wh whatever it may be, right? Whatever the breakdown may be. So yeah. you're still, at the end of the day, you're still paying that $100. Yeah. However, yeah. however, mm -hmm. the, the caveat there is, you go out, you go away for the weekend, and you leave your air conditioner blasting the whole time, right? It's going to cause 
an increase or a spike in that in that utility bill, right? Yeah. So it, that's an educational thing. But, yeah. but to combat that, is there a way? And maybe maybe it's me who doesn't understand the payment process, where in the new situation, when a resident is paying their rent or and or utility bill, is that one check coming to the housing authority, and no. then we're bifurcating it. It becomes yeah. one check to the housing authority, a separate check to the yeah. SE and G. Yeah. Yeah. The utilities will be in the resident's name. Okay. Exactly. So, so, so okay. right now that's what we don't have. Right. right. So can we? No resident has so, a PSC and G right. bill. So, so right. if we switch as a surcharge, if we mm -hmm. switch, that means that every resident has to get a PSC and G. Yes. Correct. And so you guys are aware that to open PSC and G accounts can cost up to five hundred dollars deposit, right? Yeah, and the housing authority would probably cover that. Right, right. Could I ask this and, question? Is there a way we can do it as a surcharge and continue to pay the utility? No. No way. No. Well, no. Well, there, 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 are, there are authorities that that uh, keep all of the utilities in the project's name. The authority pays them, and they're submetered, and they bill the tenants for the utility usage. So we so can do that then. That that Sub is done. Well, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I understand. You're not that. supposed to. <laughs> okay, well, now Shannon, anyway. you threw a monkey wrench. On, on, on the on the flip side, on the flip side of what you know, the scenario Mike just pointed out, where you know the hypothetical of somebody who leaves their air conditioning on. You know, I mean, there, there's there's many cases throughout history when you give somebody also the power to lower their bills. Right. They take, more, take more responsibility. I mean, right. they pay less. They pay twenty five percent of their. Right. Yeah, income. exactly. They they yeah. can actually save a few bucks by being diligent about keeping lights off yeah. and not running their AC and you know tacking their thermostat up a few degrees when they know they're going to be away for a weekend. That that's that's where they get rewarded for. Being it's responsible. it's responsible usage of utilities is what it boils yeah. down to yeah and, 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 and i get all let, of that let but... me just clarify for a second in terms of uh, not supposed to I, I think we might have been talking about two different things Jaime, you were talking about public housing correct well um when you said that uh, the authority could continue to to pay it but that certainly that certainly happens yes yeah, yeah when uh, shannon mentioned uh, you're not supposed to i think she, what she's talking about is once we convert to section eight and it's my understanding as well that you couldn't do what you described once it goes to section eight uh, that that's possible i'm 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 less of an expert on that than shannon is i'll <laughs> defer to her uh Experience. Well, we could look into that because it yeah, occurs to me that if you were going to do that, you'd have to talk to who the developer is and get them to buy into that. Uh, frankly, I've never seen a developer who would. Yeah, I, I would like to say this just at the top of the world again. Um, so, so if if a if a resident's rent is five hundred dollars right now, that's thirty percent of their income for rent and utilities. So they're paying the housing authority five hundred dollars. Under the new system, a study is done for a two bedroom unit, and say the electrical study comes back that what the electrical cost for that unit is is one hundred and twenty dollars. Right. So now instead of paying the housing authority five hundred the resident pays the housing authority 380, right? Correct. So their rent goes down, but that 120 is not paid to the housing authority and that is meant to be paid to the utility company, right? Correct. So it's not like you're paying above your 30%. And again, that if you can save money out of that 120 and only pay 100, you win. And I, I have found, I've, I've dealt with this a lot through my career. And I found that many residents love it because it puts money back in their pocket. Uh, but some residents who, again, like to keep that AC on when they're out of the house, they don't pay any attention. They wind up a little higher bill. But I've also found that the engineering studies to, to set that utility allowance, it's called, um, 
uh, is pretty conservative. They're, they're pretty good at, at saying, you know, this is a real amount that it would take for a family of four and what their utility bill to make sure that's covered. Um, so that that is what a utility allowance does. And actually, if you'll experience that sometimes, um, if, a, if a family's um, uh, rent is $100 and their utility is 120, uh, the housing authority actually reimburses them, reimburses them for that twenty dollars every month, but that's how a utility allowance works. I, I just want to make sure everyone is clear yeah, on that. I get it. Okay. Thank okay, you, director. Good. Thank yeah. you for explaining it. I get it now. I just feel like we need to start making our residents aware. I, I, I like because that. Because this can can become a real issue later on for us mm -hmm. yeah. with the and residents. Also, the new buildings might be heated with electric heat and it might be tied to the uh to the apartment in terms of billing it might mm -hmm. be on the meter and mm -hmm. these, these apartments will also be air conditioned and heated because uh, that's how it's done these days so utility bills can be very high yeah and that's an issue i i will say that one development i did um we struck a deal with the utility company that any of our people um, that came in, um, the housing authority covered the initial deposits and they were automatically accepted. So we nice. worked with the utility company from the beginning and, and there are ways to do this. And um, I also think come in. I um, also think it's important to let the residents know that there's also state programs that because of their income will also allow them to, to um, help them pay for it, such as LIHEAP, USF. Those are all applications where they can get money. Um, well, they don't actually get the money. It gets put directly into their um, PSE and G account. Um, so the state will send PSE and G directly their checks. Um, there's um, on a monthly basis, and there's also emergency money for those who unfortunately get backed up um, every, um, every few months, the state <laughs> with that that program where you can apply for emergency um, assistance and yeah. again the check doesn't go to you go to the individual it goes to the account so I think we can kind of sell it to them like that to let them know look it's not just gonna fall on you you know the, the, the we're gonna this is what we have to do but there's also these that you guys get into because most of them will qualify for it with their income. Yeah, and, sure and director can I'm sure as we're as we're moving people in and out of of units, I'm sure we could set up an initial um, uh, meeting uh, with Barbara specifically, so she could help every one of those residents apply for all of those grants. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're here. We're in the community. You know, we're here. We're right here. That's what we're here for. Yep. So right. if there's any way that we can help to start getting everybody to to when, obviously when, once we move forward. Yeah. Yeah. to start getting them into these um these programs Perfect. because even that like usf can help them with their deposit so right. if it doesn't come out of housing then why even not better allow them <laughs> to, to to give us the money i mean these are all ideas yeah. and the record we could all sit down together and yeah, you make it part of their moving process you make it that them process you sit down with yeah them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and at that point, too, by the way, you know, we'll have a, re, uh, a, a, a relocation specialist on board as well that sits with each, each family individually and works out a relocation plan. So it can be part of that with a packet, with all the information. There, there are ways to approach this. Thanks. Great idea. Good stuff. Love it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. All right, anything else? I, I think this has been productive. I yep. think we'll look forward to uh, coming and, and having uh, the public discussion at our February 10th meeting. And uh, we will uh, be uh, forming a resolution to be passed at the next meeting uh, to move us forward on our understandings. And, uh, and we'll be off in 2022. Director, I have a question with respect to what we would be presenting at the February meeting. In addition to the material that you prepared, we have what Brian did. Is that going to be part of what we would be approving? Is that going to be presented separately, or is that not necessarily going to be presented in the public discussion? 
Yeah, my, my vision of that, although it can be made to change, is that uh, we will be having a discussion about the resolution that is written. And, the, and within the resolution, we'll have our, our new, if you, if you will, our new development principles that we've fashioned um, through the memo that was written, that was given to everyone. And that was my vision, was to work off of that resolution. Um, I, I have no problem with also presenting what Brian had. I think that may be a good addition to the meeting as we present. Um, I, I think that works. Uh, does anyone Would that also be approved by resolution? Yeah. I don't know why yeah. a working document would be approved by resolution. Yeah, it was it was meant to, I mean, just to be just to be clear, yeah. it was meant to be uh illustrative to explain to the board like tonight. But um yeah. no, I, I understand that. I'm talking about going forward. I'm I'm yeah. thinking about next yeah. steps. Yeah, I don't I don't okay, see so that. I think what I just heard is we're not gonna approve that, but you don't have any problem in using it as an illustration of where we might go, but it's not gonna have the same status as the two page memo. I think that's fair, yes. Yeah, no, but I, I think I okay, think. Okay, and what I'm going to do then is I'm going to prepare a resolution, make the changes based upon the discussion tonight in the uh, two pages with the resolution to you, and then before the meeting to all of the members of the board so that they have it in front of them in advance. Well, I, we'll I try to like, get that out I early. I do like Go the on. idea. I do like the idea, especially given what this community just went through of showing as much illustrations as we can in the meeting prior to us taking a vote. I don't, I don't want people to perceive this as, um, you know, $240 million high school 2.0. But I do think that if we are still going to be tentative in terms of the details of what was done by Brian, that we want to make it clear, as he said, that this is not the same status as this two pager. It's something which is subject to further revision. The, the, by, better, by, better, yet, better yet, the fact that we're not. I, I want yeah. them to see the sausage being made a little bit more than was done with the high school. Okay. So anytime we can throw up an illustration, yeah, put all the qualifiers you want around it. But I, I want it to be on the public record as we're as we're planning that we're not just saying like, no, hey, I, I understand you're that. done, here you go, that. take it or leave it, you know? Okay. No, we Is talked that, about yeah, that several that times. The high school. And I think the language that Brian put in here about it being tentative, is very clear. He may yeah. want to go back and look to see whether or not there's anything else he wants to change before the February meeting. And I think the director just said, we're going to give it out. I just wanted to know whether or not we're going to give it sanction at this point. And what I've heard is no. Right. 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 Because there's so, as we talked about, there's development partners coming in at a later date. We can't. Yeah. No, do that. Perfect. And we need, and we we need to say that during the public meeting and say, you know, mm -hmm. this this is what these guys will be voting on. This is where it is right now. It's not going to change much, but it's going to be crystallized, and then they'll be voting on it. But hey, here's where we are. Full the full disclosure, out there in the open, right out on the table. Will the residents um, be able to understand or get a copy of this if they're not going to be able to attend the February meeting? So we don't run into this issue that we're not being transparent because everything yeah. is on the website and it's on. So if you see my social media, Barbara shares it. Uh, Danny's been putting everything up on social media, Twitter, and we keep re retweeting. So people are seeing that we're being very transparent. We have very been very transparent from day one. Uh, my only question is if people, if we're, people are not able to either a get on a Zoom, if we were in a uh, not in a COVID situation, we would have people in the room, tons of people in the room trying to understand. So I don't know how we're going to get around that, where people feel that we're we did not slight them, we're doing everything correct, we are in a, still in a pandemic, but how do we still get their buy, uh, not even buy in? How do we get their feedback? Maybe you give a plan when you're doing the survey, when you're meeting everybody. Is there something we can give the residents so they understand? I, I, think exactly? it's, I think that's why it's important to get things on the public record. And part of there's a video around this, right? And and it, it'll be it can live on our website, and people can who missed the February meeting can review it at any moment between or missed the uh, yeah February meeting can can 
give us comments between February and March. If there's something that, you know, upsets them or something they like or something they want to react to in one way or the other, they'll have a whole month to do that. And we will put out there, we plan on voting on something that's going to be crystallized between now, but this is where it's at right now. We have to do like a Nixel or something, somebody, because again, not enough people come to these meetings where I feel confident that they're going to say, you went above my head where we, yeah. we know we didn't, we know we're doing the right thing, but we're also in the middle of a pandemic. So you have to take it up another level yeah. to make sure everybody is uh, is getting the information. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, no, I like that, Eric. And I think the idea of, of a Nixel saying there's there are, there are revised development principles or whatever we're gonna call them by the time we're out of February 10th, uh, please log on and have it very prominently on top of the webpage. I think the development principles we passed out very widely when they were done last year. Yes, and I think the maybe it, they saw them. Yeah, and, and we passed them out. So I think another another version of that may be called for as well. And director, I had a resident say they didn't sign up for the Nixle when we originally were signing people up and they want to know how can they sign up for the Nixle. Yeah, it's easy. It's a, yeah, I'll, I'll recheck the web page, but I think it's pretty prominent on our web page, but I'll recheck right after. Okay. This meeting. That's no what I was actually going to say, Barbara. I think uh, when we talk about Nixle, the thing that we need to work on next is really making sure how many people are signed up for the Nixle. How many people do you guys have? Right. Because Right. So for com compared to the number of people that we have, so in making sure that those numbers are, are good. So I think that's a good push to to get that that database is uh, up to par as, as it can be. And, and Frank, mm -hmm. if, if, if I understand correctly with the Nixle, you could create subgroups. Yes. Uh, in the Nixle. By right? building. So yeah, yeah and we do. And some some yeah, buildings have more participation than others. Yeah. What um, but that's what that's. Yeah. Because people outside of the authority can also sign up for the Nixel, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you want to you want to be able to. Yeah. Right now we have it. Not for any other building. particular reason, but you yeah. want to be able to separate them when you need to. So. No, this weekend was a perfect example. There was need to to like reach very specific buildings, and be, having that those subgroups came in very handy. So. Awesome. But yeah, to to get so maybe going back to what we were talking about earlier about getting by floor by floor, so. Maybe getting this floor by floor, getting everybody's fresh phone number so that we get them onto the Nixle, getting them onto that, uh, getting them to fill the, the survey, giving them that one presentation, uh, something like a summary of the presentation. And then at that point, now we have the fresh phone numbers, we've given them the thing, they filled out the survey, and now we, we have a better ability to communicate with them. And, and I don't know if anybody has access here to, some kind of local access channel. If we can get some cable company to give us a channel, we should just have a channel that we have on a loop, the Don't HUD videos. Uh, Frank, if Frank, we did that, I think that would be both, the best. Both Cablevision and Verizon, or Optimum and Verizon, have everybody has TV. designated channels for local access. All we have to do is contact them. So we mm -hmm. can have these meetings, any public meeting should be on that channel. And we, so that we, we don't have to worry also, about them logging in. Now, as far as them, you know, participating, that's another story. But at least to view it and like I, those on the loop. Uh, yeah, you know. we, we could we could also just do it through the city's uh, public access. If you send that, like if we, our meetings or any presentations, anything like that, all we have to do is send that to the city and they could put it in their loop of council meetings or any other meetings that they're doing. So yeah, and we and but we should, we should try to get our own, our own uh, feed there. That absolutely. Yeah, if, if we can get a redevelopment feed, it just plays all day. Whenever yep. anybody is. Uh, all right. First of all, folks, we're getting a little bit yep. a field, other than talking about the redevelopment <laughs> aspect, from the closed session purpose here. I think this is a very good discussion, and we ought to have it with the entire authority in, in that type of form. I will point out to you, there's a tremendous amount of law if you decide to put all of your meetings out in the public at the same time. I know a lot of people do it. There are a lot of people that don't do it, but there are a lot of policy decisions here before we do. If we're talking about specific things, as the commissioner says, he's absolutely right. They have to put it up for you. That's part of their commitment when they got the original right to be the, your provider. On the other hand, if we're going to have all of our meetings open to the public and also on 
some service, we're going to have to make changes in how we operate. And we ought to talk about that before we do. Sure. All right. For, for, for all purposes, though, we're, we're done here, right? Yeah, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I right, agree. right. That's, I agree. Right, um, so. I, let me just make one comment. Based upon what's been said here, I thought that the best thing would be to call the next step here expanded development principles and incorporate everything from before and everything we discussed tonight into one document. Sure. You okay with that, Director? Agreed. Okay. Thank you all. Well, Very good meeting. Uh, Chairman, it's up to you. Yeah, so I'll make a motion to come out of closed session. Thank you. All right, all in Aye. favor? Aye. 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 All right. So, so we're now in the open session. No action's been taken <laughs> by the authority. There will be subsequent action, but that will be at a future meeting. Sounds good. All right, motion to close. Motion. Motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, Aye. everybody. All right, good night, everybody. Thank good you night. all. Great meeting. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks, team.